Right, guys, um, you've had your presentation from Nathan. That's obviously on uh, acquiring the, uh, the chemicals to produce experimental pyrotechnics. Now, really, we're talking about how you're going to use them when you've actually obtained them, and hopefully, we've got some good news for you. Um, brief introduction first. Um, this is really for people who's not attended before. Obviously, the majority of the normal membership know who I am. I'm Wayne Ropshaw, Wayne in the forum. Um, and for the last six or so years, I've been the major lead for the UK Pyrotechnics uh, Society Legislation and Documentation Committee. Uh, and that really means liaising with the, the bodies such as Nathan, who's just been here, and the HSE to try and clarify the very grey area that's existed over the many, many years to do with experimental pyrotechnic manufacture. This, uh, it, it's, it's taken this length of time really to get that clarif clarification and um, obviously for the ELR process to continue and almost to completion where we are now. Um, so that's who I am um, and the ELR, it's, a, it's always a mouthful, but Explosive Legislation Review is something HC led to review the existing MSER regulations of 2005 um, and which will now subsequently be renamed e Explosive Regulation 2014, and that's this year, obviously. Um, so we've been dealing with, with the HSE for the past four years, with the ELR, three or four years, um, and obviously we've been discussing various, various issues that uh, we as a society have with any uh, experimental pyrotechnic uh, manufacture. Um, the good bit ab about that, really, is to say the last piece, is up to this process, yeah, we were a society. We wasn't really recognised as such. If the, one of the major uh, plus points, together with obviously clarif clarifying the regulations, is that now UK PS, PS is, as you've seen with Nathan being here this morning, a considered and consulted part of the explosive industry, which I don't think, if we're honest, we were prior to, prior to this piece of work. So that's where we are. That's who I am. That's what we're talking about here. Um, so a resume and what, what's gone on. Now, I'm not going to spend too long on this because it's something we've gone over over the years, but it's just to give you an idea of where we've been and where we are now. Um, we started in 2008, and really that was a personal mission for me, just to try and get clarification, as we said, on uh, MSER Regulation 92A, the old 100 grams rules, as a lot of people referred to it. Uh, I want a clarification just to get an idea of whether this is a legal framework or not, that experimental pyrotechnics could be run under. And this took us all the way, really, to where we are now. Um, and the ELR started in 2010. Um, various things have gone on through the years. And as I've said in many, many, many times in these presentations, that yes, it's taken a long time. It's a very slow process. As you can imagine, for the HSE, it's a massive task. So it doesn't proceed very quickly. But you know, it does get there in the end, which is the main thing. So we've worked through the years with the HSE, very recently with the Home Office. Uh, we've, do, we've been to various meetings. And at 2012, we uh, continued that work with the LR and the Home Office, uh, sorry, and the HSE. And also then attended a meeting at the Home Office where we originally met uh, various representatives from the Home Office, which has also now created the, the relationship with Nathan, as you've just seen. Uh, so we've gone all, all through that process, it's been a long drawn out process, largely, and yet I've repeated it many times in these presentations, there's, there's a lot, a lot to say, purely because there's not a lot I can say, because it's largely uh, undefined at that stage or at these various stages. So it was more or less to just say things are happening, but you know, there's not a great deal to say at this point. Thankfully, you'll be pleased to know that'll change today. So uh, this is where we've been. This is where we were last year, and uh, this will bring us up to date. So you can see from where, where we've been, it's been a long piece of work. So just to, just to get us a bit more up to date, more recently, uh, last year, because I, I missed the AGM last year, I did send the presentation across, but I'm not sure it actually got relayed. Um, so in 2013, uh, there was, and you're probably all aware of this, anyone who's been interested in, in, the, uh, in the process, is the release of the draft explosive regula regulation from 2014. Now, due to the due to the work that we've, well, you know, I've been working with the HSE on, 
we managed to get Regulation 92A, which, as I say, is the uh, existing MSCR regulation for the 100 gram rule, um, changed very, very minorly. And this wasn't even in, in consideration of anything, any of our requirements necessarily. Um, this was purely down to their own um, definition of, of the word supply. The only thing that's been changed in that regulation is the word supply. So the bit in red down there. It used to say for not for sale. Now they're considered that, well, arguably you could give someone some. You're not selling it, but you're, you're supplying it. So that's why they changed the word supply. But the, the main thing is there, and the main thing to, to point out, if you see the bits in bold, these elements are still there. So you've got your lab analysis, testing, demonstration, experimentation. Without our input and arguably some uh, other bodies, such as the RSI, in the ELR process, that would have gone. So even though we're still only talking about the 100 grams, which is, you know, that, that, that's the other thing to say, that piece in bold may have, may have said 10 milligrams, uh, which for, from our point of view would have been practically useless. I know, I, was, and I, I know by our own admittance, 100 grams is not a lot, but it's better than nothing. And that's exactly where it could have been. So without our input into this process, that would have been significantly different. And thankfully, as we said, the only change is the word supply. And that's still in the Explosive Regulation 2014. The only thing to say on that, additionally, is that it's now been renamed. So you might need now see in the future, rather than reference to 92A, you've got Regulation 62A. Essentially the same thing, but they've obviously restructured the document. But we can keep calling it the 100 gram. You can still keep, call it that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and thankfully, it is, as a, state, as a stress, still 100 grams. Unfortunately, not any more, but certainly the main thing is not any less, which is uh, the main plus point, I would say, on that. So that's what happened in 2013. We've obviously reviewed that. I think that's been on public consultation. Everybody's had access to that. Obviously, all the, the various industry sectors have, have commented on that. And that has been the only change. So brilliant from our perspective. Quick question on that. Yeah. How do you get around the not for practical use? All ah, right. That, that is that is always been a bit of a vagarism, if you want to call it that. Practical use. And I've had this discussion with the HSC body numerous times and their term is practical use is used in an application which is used more in a business or a performance environment i.e you're experimenting with it yeah so you, you build an experimental device but then you're taking that and producing a, a show to uh, a paying public or you know you're actually including it in a professional fireworks show now that would be practical use now that arguably is different to you have a group of friends like, or you know, society members like that. I create a device to demonstrate an experimental device. Now you could argue that is still a display uh, in front of a group of people, but the, the, con the, the context in which that's produced is totally different. We're doing it from an experimental point of view to a group of people who are generally interested. And that's the definition. Now they didn't want, and this is the HSC, didn't want to overcomplicate that by you know, going back to that regulation. Um, oops. Yeah, going back to that regulation by trying to, you know, overly word that in such a way that it more or less explains what I've said. They wanted to retain it as it is and move this into guidance documentation, a bit similar to the MSER ACOP that says this, in, in reality, this regulation, in our perspective, works this way. So they've left that as is. So really to answer your point, it's still vague, but when it gets to the guidance point of view, it will be more explained, if that helps. Right, so, and this is really what we're talking here. So the, the other major prog progress we uh, have been working with, with the HSC, uh, is the beginning of the good practice guidance documentation. Now, this is an uh, initiative the HSC took. Rather than the HSC developing the explosive regulation, which the, they've done, and then associating that with an ACOP, which they did with MSER, they decided rather than that, let's forget the ACOP and let's have each industry subsector, us being experimental pyrotechnics, create their own good practice guide that's obviously using that same set of regulations, but applying that to our subsector. So this is the line that they've gone down. So uh, sometime through last year, I, I started on this document 
which really takes those regulations and applies them in more, more or less what you're saying there, in a way that uh, explains it in such a fashion that makes sense to us and it's, it hopefully removes a lot of the vagarisms that's in the regulation and obviously defines the requirement of uh, things you need to actually perform and do to make yourself legal when you're building or uh, constructing compositions or articles. So that's where that document comes from. That's been a, quite a piece of work up to press. Um, it is still ongoing, and you'll see this in a, in a, a, a while. I was, I was hoping in a way to have something ready to actually you know, post on the, on, the, on the website and hand out today. Unfortunately, uh, just, in, um, uh, just, just after Christmas, just in January, uh, the HC decided and they're almost, I would say backtrack, but changed a little bit by providing what they call now, um, uh, let me just get the terminology correct, <coughs> overarching guidance. This is literally, they supply a document which is a generic uh, guidance document based on the year 2014 that's generic and then we add this document on top. So essentially I've created this document with a lot of information in there that now I'm gonna to have to pull bits out of to, because it's replicated within their document. So essentially it's still an ongoing document. So it's not complete yet, and that's obviously why I can't you know, distribute that yet because I don't wanna put anything in people's hands um, and then they take that as verbatim and it's not gonna happen. Um, but by all means, I have brought a copy. If you wanna have a leaf through, Take it as it is and, you know, don't put too much, much weight on it. But largely the document content would, would be, like, you know, mainly there. But it's just worth bearing in mind it's not uh, completely finished yet. Which is really where we're going on, on the next slide. The next piece of work uh, for me and uh, the HSE, I've been liaising with the HSE again, is just what we've just been discussing. They've now created an overarching guidance document. And I've obviously got to update that document again. Uh, to take account of any duplication and uh, issues that's caused between the two documents. The main problem with this document for me during the creation of it is that HSE don't allow or don't want you to create a document that says this is how you do this, this is how you do that and make it very prescriptive and detailed on exactly how you do it. Reason being is that's you know th there's never a document that's going to be 100% correct that you can give in this position that would be uh, you know, an exact, re exact recipe of how you do anything. So you've got to keep it to a level which is neither vague but neither prescriptive. And it's a difficult uh, place to try and you know, create the text for that. But uh, obviously I'm liaising with the HSE and the documents going backwards and forwards together with the uh, society members and the committee, trying to get the balance there. So um, that will be coming. You'll see that this year. Um, so obviously that's one of the major issues and one of the major things that's been going on this year and obviously last year and what you've already just been discussing with Nathan. Um, obviously we've had numerous uh, conversations on the forum about that. Um, and, I, I, you know, from my perspective, I, fe I see that, you know, rather than, obviously there's, there's a monetary overhead, which is obviously, you know, still undecided, but hopefully in a, a reasonable amount. But I see that as some positive simply because it legitimises your access to the chemicals, which arguably, if we're all honest now, we can't actually say we can unless you have a business. Um, and also, you know, in the view of, uh, of, of having uh, chemicals stored at home, again, you've got a licence, just as Nathan said, to, to produce in the event any, any issues arise from, from um, uh, owning those chemicals. So I see that as a, as a bonus, and even more so now he said in certain, certain countries, the chemicals access has been banned altogether. I mean, we, we have to be glad for that really. Otherwise this could be, just forget it. So those are the two pieces of work that uh, are going on this year. Um, but as the title of this slide says, 2014 is the year. Reason being is ER, four, uh, ER 2014, bearing obviously its name, will be uh, in force in October. So what we're already saying, and what we've been talking about for the last six years will be stamped into, uh, into law. Um, now, what that means for us is, uh, if I can give you a quick timeline of where we are, 
Um, the year 2014, so explosive regulation will be presented to the HSC senior management team. This is just their process they go through and the board. So that's a part of the process to finalize the document. Um, and then it gets in, this is in June, uh, it gets submitted to the Department for Work and Pensions. It's, again, it's a part of the policy and a part of how they push this to government. Uh, obviously that'll be in a consultation process with them for a while. Um, and then in July, bearing in mind we've missed May there, uh, we um, will publish our uh, uh, guidance document together with the overarching document from the HSE. So our document will be hosted on the HSE website. It's also up to us to obviously host that on our website as well. So that's in July. So essentially this document has got to be complete and approved by July. So obviously you can see we've got still a piece of work to do before then um, and make sure everybody's happy with that. And this is, as I say, this has never been a process which I, in any way I want to alienate any part of the membership or the society. If it seems sometimes why it's a bit cloudy or a bit vague or we aren't getting updates, generally it's been because there isn't anything to say or anything I can say. So as soon as we get to the point where we can start talking openly about certain things, then it'll be all there for everybody to consider. So just, just to bear that in mind. So you'll be seeing more of this going on before we get to that July, because obviously this document will be coming out and I want some feedback from you guys to say, hang on a minute, I understand what you're saying in this part, but it's not strictly obvious or, or whatever. And naturally I'm working with the HSC on that as well. So that said, once we get to July, uh, we are done from that point of view. Really all we're waiting for, and arguably you don't even have to wait as such, is October when Ex Explosive Regulation 2014 comes into, into force. Now, as I said, arguably you don't have to wait because the regulation from our perspective has not really changed. As you saw from Regulation 6.2a as it is now, there's only changed one word which didn't affect us from 9.2a to 6.2a. So arguably it doesn't make any difference. But really, that is when we can officially say that we're there, that the, the process is finished. And just as I've clarified there, experimental pyrotechnic manufacturers recognised, clarified, accepted and legal. Now, you could argue that it has always been legal, but I would put emphasis on these three words. It's recognised, we're recognised as, as a body uh, in the industry. It's been clarified, albeit, you know, there's still vagarisms there, but the guidance document will take care of that. And it's accepted, as in the, the bodies out there, such as the Home Office, the HSC, accept that yes, you are legal if you follow the guidance and obviously the regulations. So it's been a long time getting there, yeah. but we're there. <laughs> <laughs> so with that piece of uh, work in your mind <laughs> and that good news uh, this is just the next what's next so obviously as I said I've got to complete the good practice guidance document um, get the HSC overarching document uh, combined with that and anything that comes with uh, the precursor legislation that Nathan's uh, been talking about. Now, obviously, we could add another part in there for September. Now, Nathan's just announced this will be enforced by September. So that's just another element that the guidance document will take a part of, because obviously it's, it's hand in hand. Um, and then what we are suggesting that we do as a society, bearing in mind that, you know, I'm, I obviously can tell that uh, you, you're happy with the, with the result of this, is that in 2014 and 2015, or later on in this year basically, starting next year, that we hope to host uh, possibly a few training sessions, maybe south, north, whatever, uh, training conferences to present and provide assistance with the regulations, so with ER 2014, and in combination with the Good Practice Guide. So really, what, no, it's not, training is probably a bit of a strong word, it's probably more assistance and to present the document and this is what you could do with it because as I've already said, we can't be prescriptive and say, right, you must mill black powder in this fashion, this is how you do it and this is how you put it in a tube. That's up to you guys to decide. What it will tell you is in what way to do things legally, not necessarily give you the method to build a, a firework or whatever you want to do. So that's what we're hoping to do later this year 
maybe possibly next year. And when this document gets put out there, this will obviously start making a lot of sense. What we didn't want to do is, now we've got to more or less to the end of the road, just let it go flat and leave you guys, there's the document, see ya, have, have, have a good time. Obviously we don't want to do that. We're, we're a society and this is what it's all about. And the HSC, and this is why we get the respect that we do off the HSC, that we're a body that looks after its members and wants to help them members do legitimate activity that is legal. So if we can do that, again, it uh, gives the society credibility and obviously gets value for money out of the, the membership fee as well. So that's something we're trying to do. As, as it stands, obviously, because there's a lot of work ahead of us before we get to that stage, it's undefined when and where and how and whatever. But as things move on, I'm sure we'll add some clarify, clarification to this. So that's what's next. So from a final thought point of view, and thanks for the clap there, because uh, I'm glad that, that he has that response, because uh, obviously there's some people out there that still want to do this sort of thing, because it must have been after six years, it's, uh, it's like, is it ever going to end? Um, it's really just that, that a point I've already made, the UK PS has gained recognition from both the Home Office, the HSE, and the Explosive Industry, because when I attend the meetings with the HSE, there's all group of bodies of people there that, you know, we're now a part of um, by pre bring, sorry, being proactive in the ALR process. Uh, so it's, it's worth making that point that we're not on a zone anymore. Uh, 2014 is the year we're finally hit, finally the, you know, we can see the end in sight. Um, and once you've got your hands on this document, I think, again, you'll feel a lot better about the old process. Um, and just that is one major point without our involvement. And you could argue some other people, because there's not just us that like to experiment, there's some of the chemistry bodies that, and societies that do similar, but maybe not on the same scale. They, they might use milligram quantities to make things. I know there's still some societies that may like a red fire, you know, in a, in a uh, sorry, experimentation seminar, but still not largely their interest. They're not interested in building devices generally. It's just more a red fire or a whatever it might be. So you could argue without our involvement, maybe the regulation could have been still there, but with smaller quantity limits. Without our involvement, the regulation is still there as it was. Unfortunately, not, not any larger, but still there. Uh, as it would have been eliminated in ER 2014. Now, that's not just me making that up. That's been told to me many times by people in the H HSE, plainly because it, it's hassle to them. To have people out there that's experimenting, even with 100 grams, is not something they necessarily instinctively want to allow people to do. But, as we've done many times, and I've had discussions with them many times, if you speak to them, give them a valid reason why you want to do that, absolutely they'll listen. And this has always been the, the, the thing all the way through the process. I've been surprised, just like you see with Nathan today, it's not, you see a police officer coming in front of us six or seven years ago and saying, right guys, what are you doing? I think everyone had left the room. Uh, whereas now, he's sitting there, he understands what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why we want to do it. And that's where we were, and this process has done all that. So that's one of the major points. Um, and from your point of view, I think I reiterate this every time. Uh, it speaks for itself. If we don't demonstrate our competence, all this is worthless. If we go out there and start building 12 inch shells and whatever, it's obviously up to you guys, whatever you do, but you know, nothing from a society perspective can we ever condone. Uh, you need to do, just continue demonstrating your competency and professionalism. And I know that's the case anyway, but it's just a point worth making. We've gained this credibility over the years by doing the right thing. And we obviously can't, you know, the society can't represent every individual. If we've got one bad egg that does something wrong, what can we do about that? But we don't want any, you know, any public uh, activity that the society condones being not, nothing but that. So if everyone bears that in mind, it's just one of those things that um, as a part of a professional body, we need to always remember. And to finish, I couldn't think of any other way to put it. I was trying to think of some fancy slogan for this, but it didn't, didn't come out. Uh, the future is bright for UK pyrotechnics. We've, you know, we've got there. We've actually achieved what we wanted to achieve, albeit not necessarily kilo quantities that we all wanted for experimentation, but we've got to make, uh, you know, 
allowances where, where they allow. And, and who's to know in, in years' time when we've proved ourselves that this is a legitimate uh, process that we can work with, that things might change. We've got to start somewhere, and this is where this has been. This is why I've never really overly pushed quantity limits and tried to get them pushed further up, because the brakes would have come straight on and that would have been that. So that's where we are now. Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> Someone else can have a go at that point. <laughs> so with that... Quick yeah. Yeah. Has there been any mention whatsoever of any form of allowance of greater amounts, greater freedom than the rule already exists? Not at all. No. It's, they've had the discussions, but the answer, the simple answer to that is, and this is the HEC answer, absolutely fine, you can do that now. Get yourself a license to manufacture. Because uh, they say you're not if you need more than 100 grams, you're not experimenting anymore. You could say, well, 150 grams, that's still experimentation, but they have to draw a line. And one of the major issues is a lot of the existing legislation was written, and if you look at the separation limit, it starts at 100 grams. So as soon as you go above 100 grams, you have to take account of separation. Yeah. Um, so there's already legislation in place to allow you to do that. Yeah. If you want to go that that's right, yeah. So if you want to be, build bigger devices, by all means, you can go through the full manufacturing uh, license uh, process and and get that and that's not beyond an individual to do because I know some individuals have already done that but yeah I mean that that's that's literally it that they see it well 100 grams fine for you know as it's always been for experimentation why would we need to increase that but that you know as I say you never know what might happen in the future Is it, um, in the form? yeah Right, right. Well, this hopefully this is where the guidance document will help he hell of a lot because there's, there's, there's even process diagrams in that to say, depending on what you're building, is what your storage requirements would be as well. Yeah. Um, in reality, and this is where a little bit is self-governance in a way, if you're manufacturing 100 grams of composition and you use that in one device, obviously that's quite legal. If therefore you store that device yeah. and make another one, that's also 100 grams, and store that. In reality, that's within regulation because you're storing the device. As long as you've got store, a store as well, and, and arguably, depending on how long you're storing that for, is whether you need a storage license as such, as with the existing regulation, yeah. then that is fine. True. What's the uh, tolerance on, the, uh, on that mass, 100 grams? Um, so if someone, you know, the HEC would yeah. say you've exceeded that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they would say none. So it's under 101 grams, 100.0001 is over. Literally as straightforward as that. Well, yeah. I mean, realistically, would they be that bothered? As long, you know, they're looking at coming along to your, you know, to your workshop, and you've got five kilos of black powder. Evidently, that's going to be over. If if they found 120 grams or you know, don't, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth here, but 200 grams or whatever. You know, what they really do, we may get a slap on the wrist, possibly, but, you know, obviously I couldn't make a total judgment of what they would do, but, you know, they're looking for someone who's doing stupid things. But obviously the 100 gram is the official limit, so anything over that would be contravening the regulations. So, Andrew, so would you know, obviously, Yeah, the, it depends yeah. also on your classification as well. Is that what you just said, Phil? Um, yeah, yeah, there's, there is, there's, there has been discussion around that because once you've manufactured a device, depending on its content, what is the, um, what is the classification of that? Now, that's another element where and this will be, don't get me wrong, this, this document is something that's going to evolve over the years. It's not one that gets released in its first draft. It's not going to be perfect and it's not going to be fully, yes, this is how you do it. And as I said, it's never going to be that anyway. But yeah, certain elements where you've got a combination of this, that and the other, certain things need considering. But um, 
90% hopefully this will add clarification to what we all need to do if we want to do this type of activity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's generally anything that needs colour is anything that's black powder or black powder composition based. So you could argue charcoal star is black powder. Yeah. So in some respects that would need colour certificate as well, which is another element of this. Bear in mind I haven't relayed anything in this presentation today what the requirements are that we need to do. This is where the document will come in because I couldn't possibly try and squeeze it in a 15 minute presentation. But this is where the training element, as we've said, may, that may happen end of this year and maybe next, would actually pull all this thing together. But there is an element that you will need colour, uh, depending on what you're doing. I, I guess for 95% of people here that want to do that will need a colour certificate. It's going to be easy to get once you've already picked one. Because exactly. You yeah. Can I, yeah. Can I chip in there? Of course you can. The colour is actually um, part, is, is also going to a change and is part of the exposure population 2014. So that yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, and under that, the flash powder is yeah. a, a licensed uh, material. Yeah. You won't get any flash anymore as a point as a yeah. or whatever it is, unless you've got a license for acquiring uh, that material. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Don't want anybody <coughs> falling down with that. Um, just want to right. thank you. Yep, cheers. Cheers, Steve. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're there. Um, if anybody's got any other questions that want to ask offline anything more detailed or certainly by all, count, all, by all accounts, you know, have a, have a look at the existing document. Um, feel free. That's me. Okay. Cheers. Thank you.